The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to episode 10 of the Pelicans cast brought to you by HoopBall.com. We're providing in-flight insight for all Pella fans out there. I'm your host, Nick Garisco, and you can find me at Fantasy Law Guy on Twitter. And hey, while you're at it, if you like what you hear today, please subscribe to this podcast and give us a great rating on your preferred podcast provider. Check out HoopBall.com for some great fantasy basketball analysis. And that's exactly what we're going to do Today, we're going to talk fantasy basketball. As we discussed in last week's episode, our usual Pelicans expert, Michael Pelache, and my co-host, he is on a two-week mission trip in Spain. So he is out today. Uh, it'll be all me, unfortunately, for you guys. But don't sign out. I think it's going to be a great show. We're going to cover all the Pelicans players' fantasy production thus far, the outlooks of what to expect in the future, And hopefully I'll provide some actionable advice on whether you should be buying low or selling high on your Pelicans players or just riding it out. And for those of you Pella fans who aren't playing fantasy basketball but do follow the Pelicans, I still think this can be a very valuable podcast and at least give some good insight on how certain Pels players are performing from a statistical perspective. Um, And and besides, I mean, we've covered the Pelicans' struggles plenty, right? Right. So we probably want to take a break from that depression right now. Uh, I'll still still give a quick little update on the Pelicans last week of action. Uh, We got stomped at home by the Toronto Raptors. That's the second time they've beaten us this season. Uh, We did beat the Charlotte Hornets on the second half of a back-to-back. And that that was a pretty good win for the Pelicans there in Charlotte. And then we lost a close but hard fart game. Hard fart. Excuse me for that. Jeez. Uh, that, that is an unfortunate misspeaking right there. Hard fought game <laughs> without Brandon Ingram to the Houston Rockets on Monday. Uh, New Orleans is now 2-8 and eight through 10 games. And that's an eighth of the season is gone already. So it's not looking good for the Pels. So let's go ahead and get to the fantasy basketball evaluations. That's when you want to escape reality there and talk about fantasy. Uh, we don't want to talk about the harsh realities of the Pelican season. We'll, we'll save that for Pelache when he returns. Uh, I'm going to go in order from the 2019-2020 season per game ranking here when I talk about each Pelicans player. And I'll be speaking from a 12-team, 9-cat that's nine category perspective throughout. For those of you listeners who are unfamiliar with fantasy basketball, or maybe you've never played, I highly recommend it. Uh, in most leagues, you are scored by amassing numbers in nine categories. That is points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, three points made, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and turnovers. And a player's overall value or ranking is configured by taking their performances in these nine statistical categories and essentially combining them Uh, making the weight of all categories equal. So therefore, kind of accounting for statistical scarcity. For example, a block is more valuable than a point in a category league because blocks are more rare and they are harder to come by. Um, Let's start by focusing on the Pelicans' best fantasy player so far this season, and that's been Brandon Ingram. Uh, He's played nine games this year, missing one with a concussion-like symptoms here. He's averaging 26 points a game, 2.6 three points, three pointers made, 7.3 rebounds, 3.9 assists, um, 0.7 steals, 0.9 blocks, and he's averaging 53% shooting and shooting 72% from the line, 3.1 turnovers per game. Now, Brandon Ingram is hurt right now. He is having a great season, but he is questionable for tonight's game against the Los Angeles Clippers with right knee soreness. Uh, I think the best part about Brandon Ingram, other than the fact that he's having a career year and other than the fact that you drafted him late, if you did draft him, he's been one of the breakout players uh, of the NBA season and also from a fantasy basketball perspective. He is, I think the most unexpected part of Brandon Ingram's fantasy success is his three-pointing 
three point three pointing three point shooting here. He is making three. I mean, two point six three point shots made per game. His career average in three years prior to that is 0.7. So a massive increase there to 2.6 per game. And he had only averaged about two attempts from deep per game throughout his career until this season. He is attempting 5.4 shots beyond the arc. I mean, this is an intense, uh, very significant increase in three-point shots attempted and three-point shots made. He is shooting nearly 50% from three. Now, this is bound to regress, obviously. Um, Last year, he hit 33% of those uh, field goal attempts from three. This year, he's up at 47%, to be precise. Uh, You you can make the argument that his three-pointers are going to regress. You can also make the argument that his points per game are going to regress when Zion Williamson comes back. Right now, again, he's averaging 26 points per game. I think that's fair to... Expect regression in both of those categories. However, um, well, actually, I want to say a third category that you inspect regression from is his rebounds. He's averaging 7.3 rebounds a game. I think that number is pretty high. I would expect that to uh, decrease slightly. And this is another factor that's going to decrease when Zion Williamson returns. Brandon Ingram is ranked as the 21st best overall player on a per-game basis this year in fantasy basketball assuming you're in a nine-cat league, uh, 21st. I mean, that is that is extremely good. Uh, I still think that he is, despite this expected regression, I still think he's going to comfortably land inside the top 50 overall players by season's end. I think you drafted him at a discount. So I wouldn't really recommend buying low on Ingram, obviously, because I think you would be paying a high price for uh fewer statistics here or for lack of better words I think his value is only going to decline here he'll continue to play probably out of his mind it probably but once Zion Williamson returns once Drew Holiday starts hitting these shots I can see him kind of regressing on his again on his uh three-point shots made obviously that kind of ties into his field goal percentage too and of course his rebounding will likely go down as well Um, if anything will come up or go down, depending on how you look at it, would be turnovers there. 3.1 turnovers a game is not a great number, but I do think that has room for positive regression there. However, I wouldn't recommend kind of, you know, selling Ingram at his highest peak because, hey, you drafted him really late. I would kind of ride it out. I do think he's going to comfortably land inside the top 50 this season. So although he is ranked 20 first right now and I could see that dropping down to the 30s or 40s range here uh, by season's end I still think this is something you should probably just write out I would say enjoy it I wouldn't make any actionable really moves on Brandon Ingram now if somebody offers you a top 25 player sure this is not something you're going to decline but I just don't I feel that a lot of people out there are pretty skeptical of whether this level of performance is going to continue. I don't think very many savvy fantasy basketball players are expecting him to finish as a top 25 overall player by season's end, but I think most are expecting top 50, and that's what I'm expecting too. So I think the strategy with Ingram here is just to kind of enjoy your late round steal and just kind of ride it out. I'm not going to recommend any, um, you know, crazy advice in terms of trying to sell him or trade him high while his value's high or trying to, you know, mortgage the farm to try to acquire him. When, of course, I think it's highly probable that his best numbers are behind him or we are kind of in the midst of it right now. And we should expect regression in a couple of categories later. Uh, Let's get on to Drew Holiday here. Uh, He is the 72nd ranked player per game right now and we know why it's because of his shooting he's only averaging 14.6 points per game right now only 1.3 uh three pointers made his other numbers are quite good in in other categories other than his uh i would say his points per game and field goal percentage all of his other categories are staying right on par with the last three years of the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, we're looking at uh, 5.4 rebounds a game, 7.3 assists, 1.9 steals. He's always going to be great in the steals department. Uh, and 0.8 blocks, which is great for his position. So, uh, up, But you're looking at 36.4% from the field. And this is bad because this is hurting you in a category because he's taking a lot of shots per game. 
and he's only averaging 14.6. So Drew Holiday, we've talked about it before on this pod in the last couple episodes because it seems like he has been on a shooting slump for the first the entirety of the season, which again is uh, 10 games so far. Uh, I expect Drew Holiday to get out of his shooting slump. You don't just become a a war, you know a terrible shooter overnight. Drew Holiday has you know he's hitting 27 percent of his three point shots. This is a number unlike Brandon Ingram that you would expect to 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 rise. You would expect to go up as the season progresses, and he just kind of breaks out of this slump. I know that Alvin Gentry has also been kind of talking about Drew Holiday's slump in his recent pressers. He says that, you know, Drew Holiday even spoke about it too. He said, I'm just going to keep pushing. He says that everybody goes through slumps. I'm not shooting too efficiently. I've missed free throws. I've missed easy buckets from the rim. And my three-point shot is not falling. But I'm making other things happen. Uh, making other things happen. And so I know I'm not out there just scoring. I can produce in other ways. He is right about that. We just spoke about how his, his numbers are up to his standard in the last couple of years on other categories, but we're really focused on the shot here. Alvin Gentry echoed Drew's sentiments. He said that he sat down with Drew recently and he kind of implored him to be more aggressive on his shot selection. Again, I think he's going to get out of this slump. I wouldn't worry about his shooting slump. It is kind of annoying that it's happened for 10 games. And maybe it's possible that the Drew, the person rostering Drew Holiday in your fantasy basketball league is upset with it, and they've seen enough. Maybe they are Pella fans, and maybe they are just upset with the direction the team looks like they're heading. They're 2-8, and eight, and maybe they fear that Drew Holiday, this is a lost season, and that Drew Holiday might be um, kind of rested every now and then as the season progresses, as the Pelicans may focus on young player development as the season progresses. I'm not too worried about that. And I'm also not worried about his shot continually not falling. Um, he has shot over 50% from the field in the last two seasons, and he actually shot 49.8% three years ago with the Pelicans. Right now, again, he's at 43.6%. Uh, this is a big deal because you know when you're not shooting well, it doesn't just affect your your field goal percentage category, like your efficiency in that category, but of course it also affects your points per game. It also affects your free throw percentage, which is a little lower than his career average. And it, of course, it affects your three points made. I mean, we're talking about a three, cat- three four category uh, swing if he can just get out of this shooting slump and gain more confidence here. He's confident he will. Alvin Gentry's confident he will. I'm also sharing that sentiment there. I think Drew Holiday, for those reasons, is a buy low because if he can get out of this slump, Drew Holiday, you're looking at a top 25 overall value. Again, his average draft position in fantasy basketball this year was around the round three, uh, sorry, around the round two, round three turn. So you're looking at actually really like a top 24 overall player that Drew Holiday can be. I'm not worried about Zion really affecting his workload here. I think if anything, that might help his efficiency. Um, Even if it takes away some of his counting numbers, particularly I'm, I'm eyeing rebounds, for example, uh, I know that his assists might be a slight, uh, slightly higher than they will be uh, just because Lonzo Ball's missed a couple of games. So Drew's had to take more of a distributing role. But uh, this is, I expect his peripheral numbers to be around, you know, par for what they've been so far. It really is just a shooting issue with Drew. So if some of your fantasy managers are getting upset throughout this shooting slump and they want more of a scorer, and they think that you know they're only looking at the basic numbers, you know, points and field goal percentage. Then I think that you should be able to attack and aggressively target Drew Holiday as a potential buy low. There, uh, again, we don't want to sell, uh, we don't want to give one of your best players up. But if you can package two of your kind of mid-range guys who are kind of performing well or hot to start the season. And maybe you can catch the uh, Drew Holiday uh, fantasy manager on a bad day and potentially get a top 25 player from this moment on. That's something I would definitely look to do. Um, Josh Hart is actually our third highest ranked fantasy basketball player. He's ranked in the top 50 overall in a per game basis of nine category fantasy basketball leagues. 
This is insane, right? I mean, Josh Hart, everyone's kind of waiting for it to die down. And it might now that he has uh, picked up a few injuries, right? He's He's already been ruled out for the uh, Los Angeles Clippers game on Thursday. The Pelicans also have two games this weekend. Uh, they have a back-to-back on Saturday and Sunday. So at the very minimum, he should be considered questionable for those games. But left knee sprain, left anchor sprain, it's two injuries that he's dealing with. And it's possible that his hot start as a, uh, in his new career as a Pelican is going to dwindle down. Uh, but let's just talk about what he's done so far. Again, 49th ranked player overall in fantasy basketball on a per-game basis. Again, nine category leagues, what we're talking about. Top 50. A lot of people would not guess that if they were um, given that trivia question, especially if they're not Pelicans fans. Uh, He's averaging 27.7 minutes a game. This is not a fantasy basketball category, but it's worth noting because it is a it is a lofty number for a player that was expected to just be a kind of a low end rotational player going into the season. So his minutes are fine. 12.6 points per game, 2.23 point shots made per game, 6.6 rebounds, only 1.4 assists, but 1.4 steals, a half a block a game, and he's shooting 46% from the field. And his free throws are great. 81% from the line and only 1.4 turnovers. Josh Hart is having a great fantasy basketball season thus far. And I know it's not showing in the Pelicans record, but it is perfectly showing um, showing itself out on the Pelicans box scores. So Hart is one of the, I would argue, biggest breakout players of the year. I, I shouldn't say breakout. I should say I think a more accurate term here is sleeper. And I know a lot of people kind of overuse that term. Like they're like, oh yeah, Brandon Ingram's a real sleeper this year. No, not really. People knew Brandon Ingram was a pretty good basketball player. He's he's a breakout player this year. But as somebody who cares a lot about the terminology here as an attorney, but also as as an avid fantasy basketball and fantasy football player here, uh, the terminology is important here. Uh, Josh Hart is, you know, Brandon Ingram is a breakout player. He's not a sleeper. Brandon Ingram, it's not like he wasn't on people's radars. Josh Hart was validly not on people's radars. Like he was, his average draft position was non-existent because he was not drafted in most standard 12-team leagues. He was not on the fantasy radar. And, you know, you probably picked him up off the wire if you have him. And he's been one of the great additions this season. Um... Even the biggest Pella fans out there were likely not even, you know, considering drafting him in any normal fantasy basketball format. Um, so what does that mean going forward? It doesn't mean that, you know, he's just going to wither away and this is a total fluke. But it does mean that we're likely looking at regression here. I think Hart has really benefited from a lot of the injuries that the Pelicans have sustained early in the season. We've already seen Lonzo Ball miss games. We've Obviously, Zion Williamson is missing games, so that opens up an extra spot there. Derek Favors is not uh, has not been totally healthy, and he's played limited minutes in a lot of games. Um, Drew Holiday has also missed, game and even Brandon, uh, missed two games, and even Brandon Ingram has missed a game. So Josh Hart, uh, kind of by default, has been one of the only healthy Pelicans so far. And, you know, he deserves credit for that, of course. But when we're kind of looking at his fantasy outlook going forward, we're going to take note that a lot of his production may be unsustainable as it is now simply because he's been the only healthy Pelican, really, I mean, one of the only ones throughout the entire team. And as some of these players get back to full strength, his numbers may decline. The numbers I'm looking at particularly... uh, 2.33 2.33 point shots made a game. That is, let me repeat, 2.2 three pointers made per game. And that 6.6 rebounds, probably going to come down. He's also doing a great job in the steals department. 1.4 steals. I think that's one of the main reasons his value is so high. Uh, th- those, those three categories, I can kind of expect him to go down as his minutes. Again, he's playing 27 minute, over 27 minutes per game uh, as those come down. But but make no mistake about it, Josh Hart has been a very pleasant surprise for all Pelicans, uh, Pella fans out there, and he's certainly been a pleasant surprise for those who have, um, who were had the foresight to pick him up on the waiver wire. Uh, I don't think Josh Hart is. I'm not going to sit here and try to act smart or try to act like one of those experts by, you know, conventional guys who are saying, "Oh yeah, 
Uh, yeah, definitely sell Josh Hart high. Yeah, no duh. Of course, no joke we're going to try to sell Josh Hart high. But that's not really actionable advice because uh, you're not really getting those offers from other teams. You're not really getting those acceptances from other managers in your fantasy basketball league. Um, unless you're playing with all Pella fans out there who just love Josh Hart and just love following him on Twitter, you're not getting a top 50 player for Josh Hart. I mean, nobody in their right mind is really doing that because I think it's fair to say that most people, at least most competitive fantasy basketball managers, are expecting Josh Hart's uh, top 50 numbers uh, to not continue. They are not expecting Josh Hart to finish the season in a top in the top 50 overall on a per game basis. Could we see a top 100 overall player by season's end? Yeah, I could see it, but I think it's going to be closer to 80, 90, maybe around a hundredth ranked player by season's end. And you're not going to be able to sell him high realistically here because nobody's really buying that he's going to continue. And I think even if you could make the argument that they were, I think your sell high opportunity, if there were one, is now the window is closed shut there because now he has those two injuries, right? He has the left knee sprain and the left ankle sprain. So it's just really tough at this point and not very prudent of me to say sell Josh Hart high when I just don't see that as being very feasible as long as you're playing in any remotely competitive fantasy basketball league. So he's going to be have he's probably going to have to be somebody that you kind of ride out and hope he ends up as a top 100 um, inside the top 100 by season's end. Um, again, I think Josh Hart will stay a big part of the rotation, but I think it's fair to say that he will probably not finish as the 49th ranked player on a per game basis from a fantasy basketball perspective. Lonzo Ball, he is ranked 80th overall on a per game basis. Again, nine category league. He's averaging 11.5 points per game. Uh, this is in eight games because he has missed some games due to injury, two games here. And I think he is missing tonight as well. He's been ruled out against the Clippers. Uh, so it's safe to say that he's at least questionable again for just like Hart for those uh, that back-to-back on Saturday or Sunday. So he could miss more action there. Uh, he is making 2.3 Three-point shots made per game. That is a good number. 4.5 rebounds, 6.1 assists is great. He's helping you in other categories, especially for a point guard. Uh, it's helping you in the rebound category there. Uh, 1.6 steals, helping you there. Uh, virtually no blocks, pretty much non-existent there. Uh, he is not a very efficient player, so he's not really helping you in the efficiency categories there. Um, he's only hitting just above 40% of his field goals made. And just above 60%, actually, he's right at 60% of his free throws made. Now, this is an improvement from last year, but he's not an ultimate killer. A lot of people who play fantasy basketball will say Lonzo Ball is, you know, oh, he's, he's going to wreck your free throw percentage. You know, he can't shoot a free throw worth a lick. Well, while it's true that he is a terrible free throw shooter, especially for his position, he's not actually hurting you in his free throw percentage. Why? Because he's not taking a lot per game. He's only averaging 1.3 free throws attempts per game. So he's not really, I wouldn't say he's helping your free throw category by any means. He, he's definitely hurting you there. But he's not, you know, killing you there. He's not crippling your free throw uh, percentage like maybe, I don't know, like a DeAndre Jordan or Andre Drummond are who are getting the attempts and sinking your free throw percentage there. Although Drummond is shooting much better this season. Uh, from the line but this is not about him this is about Lonzo Ball and this is a, to me this is about his injuries what his outlook is based on his health right I am a uh, I am kind of notorious among my friends and among listeners as kind of being an injury pessimist right I am certainly never mistaken for an injury optimist when I'm given a timeline of you know something like four to eight weeks I'm automatically assuming that it's at least going to be eight weeks uh, or at least seven, we should say. And anytime, you know, I, I don't draft fantasy players, whether it's football or basketball, if they are dealing with an injury, because injury optimism uh, basically kills teams. And, that, and that's something I highly subscribe to. It's one of my philosophies in fantasy sports. I think injury optimism is, is, is really a fatal flaw and a kind of a bias that a lot of the public kind of gets burned by far, far, far more often than uh, not. 
So I steer clear from players who uh, are injured going into the season. And not that Lonzo Ball was injured going into the season. We don't really know that for sure. But my point is this. Lonzo Ball right now, look at, look at the scenario here. He has played 52 games as a rookie. He played 47 games last season. Now he's already missed three, if you include tonight. It's probably going to be four and five if he misses this weekend. He's had calf cramps. He has an abductor strain. He's had ankle issues. Um, and we've heard that the chronic, I mean, the ankle issues may be uh, a, a chronic condition. Like it may uh, affect him long term. Uh, until he can prove he can stay on the court, I'm certainly not interested in giving up capital to buy low on Lonzo Ball, especially because I think maybe his ceiling is a little lower than people think. We've already, again, a lot, he was drafted around the 50s and 60s. Uh, that was his average draft position. But again, he is performing so far as the 80th ranked player on a per game basis. And this only considers the games that he has played. So even when he comes back at full health, if you're going to get a guy who maybe ranks in the 80 or top 70, top 80, and isn't a top 50 player, is it really worth it to trade capital uh, just to buy low on Lonzo Ball while you also have to deal with you know the uncertainty of his injuries? So this is not somebody that uh, I am looking to acquire. And if I have Lonzo Ball, I'm really hoping that I have an IR spot on my roster. And I don't know why your league commissioner would not allow that, or I wouldn't know why you wouldn't have that. IR spots are very important, especially we're seeing a lot of them, a lot of injuries lately, like to Ibaka and Chris Middleton and uh, Karis LeVert and other players who have, it's, it's been a rough week of injuries in fantasy basketball, I should say. Um, Derek Favors is the next Pelicans player here. He has only played seven games. And we have talked about Derek Favors ad nauseum here. Uh, he is the 156th ranked fantasy basketball player on a per game basis. And that's because he's just not getting the opportunities. Uh, he's only played 21 minutes per game. This is way lower than what we could have projected going into the season, where it was going to be at least 27 minutes, I would have argued, per, per game is what I would have expected going into this season, but so far he's been a total flop. I mean, there's really no other way to describe his fantasy performances so far. Uh, 7.6 points per game, much lower than expected. 8.0 uh, rebounds a game, which isn't terrible, but again, that number will rise if he would just get the minutes. The issue is that the main issue that's dragging his fantasy value down isn't his percentages. He's shooting almost 60% from the field. Uh, although he is only shooting uh, a 33% from the line, but that's only on 0.4 free throws attempts a game. That number is uh, just a very small sample size. We can't look into anything like that. But the reason his fantasy value is suppressed and he's been such a bust other than the minutes is because his blocks are down. I mean, 0.4 blocks a game. This is not what we wanted from Derek Favors. We expected at least a block per game from Derek Favors there. Uh, I would uh, argue, or I would want, at least if I drafted him, probably pushing into that 1.4 blocks per game, maybe 1.5 blocks per game. I think he has that capability, especially since he was going to play the full-time center role in New Orleans when he was kind of overshadowed by the blockmeister Rudy Gobert in Utah. So I think it was fair to expect 1.5 blocks per game around that number. He's only given you 0.4. Uh, this is um, abysmal, it is miserable, and it is hopefully something he can improve on. Now, Derek Favors, he's had one of the main reasons he's been such a fantasy bust is because we mentioned the lack of minutes, but why is he not playing the minutes, right? Like, let's get to the heart of this. Remember, he had the hamstring woes and the hamstring issues in the preseason. He wasn't really able to really suit up for preseason, play a lot of valuable minutes there. And then right when the regular season starts, he has knee soreness. So he's not only is he having hamstring and knee issues, but let's talk about how this really affects his play here because it's one thing if you're just playing on injury. But if you're trying to get in shape to play in one of the fastest-paced offenses in the NBA, which is the Pelicans, then it's going to be tough to get in real basketball shape when you're dealing with a hamstring ailment throughout preseason and you're dealing with a uh, right knee soreness during the games, when the games have started. So 
It has been tough for him to get in shape, hence the low minutes, hence him not running the court as well as we have seen in Utah. However, there is reason, despite all of this, you know, me ragging on Derek Favors, uh, clearly he's been a massive bust so far, one of the probably, I'd argue, the biggest flops in fantasy basketball thus far. However, there is reason for optimism. Um, there is certainly reason for optimism. Um, he only played 19 minutes on Friday versus the Raptors, but then he then that jumped up to 29 minutes, a season high, on the second of a back-to-back, which is good. That shows that he doesn't have to be rested on the back-to-back, that he's healthy enough to play there. Uh, and he had his best game to date. He had 10 points, 10 boards, so barely managed a double-double, but he also helped in other categories. Three assists, two blocks. And this was his best assistable game to date, I believe. And now... Um, you know, it might be a little harder to buy low when people see that game, but I still think people might not be totally buying into Derek Favors, and I still think now might be a time to strike here. I think it, I think Derek Favors is probably one of the best buy low candidates in fantasy basketball. And again, we're not to the point where, you know, it's easy to say buy low after, you know, four games or something like that, but we're 10 games in. And people have, and if they're in category leagues, they've already almost finished, uh, or they're three and a half weeks in. They might have a bad record already. They might be looking for players who can help them now, and they might not want to deal with Derek Favors any longer. You know how emotional fantasy uh, managers can get, and they might be have been waiting for Derek Favors to kind of have this breakout game or resurgence or have an uptick in minutes for ten games now, and they might be totally. Uh, losing patience and be frustrated with the entire situation. Uh, they might feel like Derek Favors personally wronged them for uh, them drafting Derek Favors so high and then you know being a total uh, you know debacle here. So you never know what the situation is with a fantasy manager here. Derek Favors is somebody I legitimately think you can buy low in your fantasy league, and I would highly recommend it. I think that Derek Favors from this point on, will comfortably be a top 100 overall player, even though he's ranked 156 right now. Uh, I can see the minutes going up as he gets into better shape. I I foresee him being kind of a, from this point forward, kind of a averaging a double-double, right? I mean, I think he'll average around 10 points a game and probably right around that cusp, right around nine rebounds a game. So a low-end double-double, he's not ever going to really help you in the assists, the steals, but those blocks, I feel comfortable saying at least one per game uh, for the rest of the season. And again, you're also getting good efficiency from Derek Favors. He is a a good shooter. He's going to shoot close to 55 60% from the field. So uh, Derek Favors is probably only going to help your fantasy team way more often than he hurts it from this point going forward. So he's somebody that uh, I would definitely try to be target and kind of seeing if the Derek Favors manager of your fantasy league is looking for some kind of deal. Uh, comfortably should rank in the top 100 for the rest of the season. J.J. Redick is our next player ranked. Uh, 175th overall is his ranking in a per-game basis, nine-category league. Uh, he's averaging 12 points a game. He's averaging 30 three-pointers a game, and that's kind of what he is. Derek uh, J.J. Redick is just kind of a three-point specialist. Now, he was drafted. Uh, his ADP was around 150, so he's been the 175th-ranked player, but it still feels like there's been some... Di- so you could make the contention that, yeah, this is kind of what we expected of J.J. Redick, you know, just being a three-point specialist here. Uh, however, I think more people would be considered J.J. Redick's season so far to be a disappointment. Um, again, you know, only 12 points a game. The three, the 3.0, three points made, that's a lot of threes there, is good. That's what we wanted. But he just hurts you in every other category, right? 1.9 rebounds per game, 1.4 assists per game, only 0.4 steals a game, 0.5 blocks a game, which is actually surprisingly higher than I thought, but only shooting 40% per game. Of course, he's going to help you at the free throw line, of course, but pretty much every other category than other than three-pointers and field, uh, three, free throw percentage, he is hurting you or at the very minimum not helping you. So... Uh, to me, Redick is borderline droppable. 
And I, actually, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it. I think he is droppable in any 12-team format. Um, unless your team is deeper than a 12-team league, I wouldn't really recommend rostering J.J. Redick. I would use that last. If he's your worst player in your roster, I would use that last spot to be um, kind of conscious, conscientious about the streaming options each week and try to get extra counting stats on your categories as you can stream options, uh, just kind of um, letting go of J.J. Redick for the hot, either the hot waiver wire ad or streaming players throughout the week, assuming you have a uh, acquisition limit and trying to get the most of certain categories that you might need. Um, if you were to pick up J.J. Redick, I could see, envision a scenario, of course, where you are playing in a category league and it's late in the week. Maybe like right now, for example, um, it's already Thursday and he's about to play the Clippers. And then J.J. Redick's also about to play the uh, – he's about to have two games, Saturday and Sunday. So if you are in a categories league and you are close in that three-point category right there, that three-point uh, shots made – that category, um, and you're close, and you're playing against your opponent, and y'all both are at, I don't know, let's just throw out, like he's at 46 threes, and you're at 49 threes, and you want to either catch up or keep that category um, as a win for you this week, then J.J. Redick is definitely worth streaming as a three-point special specialist when the Pelicans have a lot of games. Just towards the end of the week, right now is a perfect example of that. But aside from that, I, I think he's safely droppable in 12-team formats. Um, again, he, it's just a very limited basis where J.J. Redick becomes valuable in fantasy uh, basketball formats here. Jaleel Okafor, he's ranked 172nd. Uh, in nine cat leagues in a per game basis, he's played nine games. The one game he did not play was recently. He was a uh, he was a DNP CD. That stands for did not uh, did not play. Coach's decision. That is bad news. That means Alvin Gentry is uh, kind of messing with his rotations, which of course he's been doing all season long. He is uh, kind of in the fantasy basketball community. He's kind of getting notorious for uh, you know probably. Messing is with rotations as much as like David Fisdale does with the Knicks here. Uh, but he's still trying to figure this all out. We've talked a lot about this on the podcast. The Pelicans really didn't get their preseason. And when they did, um, I mean, they have all these new players. They didn't get their, they got, we're expecting that preseason was Zion Williamson. He went down, so it's had to shuffle everything. So they're still trying to figure out what works. I know it's frustrating as a Pella fan. I know it's already 10 games, one eighth into the season. Uh, however, Gentry has um, had no choice, right? His The injuries have been ridiculous this season. Um, Josh Hart is hurt now. Lonzo Ball's been hurt. Uh, Drew Holiday missed a couple na- games with a knee. Brandon Ingram missed a game with a concussion. Obviously, Zion Williamson's been out. Derek Favors has not been in shape. I mean, we are just naming constant injuries to Pel- Pelicans players here. So that has forced Alvin Gentry's hand on seeing what a quality rotation is. Uh, can look like here and figuring out what works. Uh, On Saturday, he decided against the Hornets, he decided that Jaleel Oakford does not work. And and we're seeing a little bit more of Jackson Hayes. And we might see that uh, more often, especially if the Pelicans keep losing. And this becomes more on a balancing scale and it turns into a uh, more of a developmental season. We will see less of Jaleel Oakford and more of Jackson Hayes. This is something to keep in mind. Uh, To me, for these reasons, I don't think Jale- Jaleel Okafor is a really a rosterable, roster-able player in 12-team formats. Now, if you're in a deeper league yet, sure, you can you can kind of hold on and see how these injuries play out. But especially now that Derek Favors has returned and he played a season-high 29 minutes um, on Saturday. Uh, sorry, I, excuse me, on Monday against the Rockets. I think now is probably the time to really move on. Actually, I, I would make the argument that once he had his uh, DNP CD on Saturday against the Hornets, it was time to move on. But if you're still holding on to Ja, I think it is time to move on at this point. Uh, for uh, you know, the Pelicans are only going to have more big men uh, impeding or, or creeping into Ja's minutes here. Uh, Zion Williamson's going to return in a couple weeks. Uh, Derek Favors is looking like he's getting healthy. Uh, again, Jackson Hayes, if the Pelicans keep losing, he's going to become more of a presence at the expense of Jaleel Okafor. I know Okafor has had some some very good 
fantasy basketball games this season. They've been sporadic, but they've been existent. However, it's the arrow is trending down on Ja, so I think he is droppable in uh, twelve team formats, especially ten team formats, and and I would even argue uh, fourteen format fourteen team formats as well. Um, let's get to let's see. Uh, I I think the the next fantasy relevant player right here is Kendrick Kenrich Williams. Uh, I definitely want to talk about him because. Uh, he's one of the few Pelicans players who's played all 10 games. He's not hurt, not bitten by the injury bug this season. Uh, he's kind of been on the back end of the rotation throughout the season, except now it's starting to pick up. Kenrich Williams has the 157th ranked fantasy basketball player at only uh, on a per game basis at only 20 minutes per game this season. Uh, he does a little bit of everything. But right now, he's kind of seizing his opportunity in the starting lineup uh, against the Charlotte Hornets. He had uh, 15 points, five boards, three assists, two steals, one block, three threes, and no turnovers in 28 minutes. And he followed that up with another good performance, not at quite as good, but another good performance against the Rockets. So in the last two games, Kendrick Williams has been putting up, posting some great fantasy numbers. Um I would say enough so to where he is definitely somebody that you want to stream this week. In fact, um, he's probably available on most waiver wires, especially if you're in a 12-team league. Uh, He's definitely someone I want to look at in category leagues and not just look at. Actually, just, you know, let's let's make this affirmative here. Let's go ahead and add him. I, I would suggest adding him, especially if you have a player if you have any type of player to drop or if you're streaming that last spot on your roster, as you should probably be uh, in a category league, uh, he is a great streamer for the weekend. Why? Because not only is he going to help you in pretty much every category and get those counting stats up, but also mainly because he's getting the opportunity because all of these injuries with the Pelicans. I've already mentioned it throughout this episode. Um, Lonzo Ball has already been ruled out for tonight's game. And that means he, at the very best, he's going to be questionable for the back-to-back on Saturday and Sunday. The same will hold true with Josh Hart. So those two players, Kenrich, Kenrich Williams, not only going to start for the Pelicans, but he's going to get pretty much all the minutes he can handle. So, But here's the biggest reason. Here's the biggest reason to add Kendrick Williams for this week in a category league. The Pelicans have three games in the next four nights. They play Thursday, they play Saturday, and they play Sunday. So before your week ends, he'll get three more games. So it is definitely time to add Kendrick. Ken, I keep saying Kendrick. I apologize to Ken, Ken Rich Williams. I almost did it again there. But it is definitely time to add Williams, I should say, in your fantasy basketball uh, leagues, uh, at least you know for this week. Let's see what happens with Lonzo Ball's injury. Let's see what happens with Josh Hart. Um, and... You know, let let's use him for the rest of the week because I think he's going to be a very valuable streamer that can give you the edge with the three games in the four nights and get those counting stats up in a variety of different categories. I mean, he gets steals, he gets the occasional block, um, he gets you know he'll probably average about ten points in that span in the next three games. Uh, he he shoots threes. I mean, he really kind of helps you a little bit everywhere. He does a little bit of everything. And Alvin Gentry was also. Uh, seemed to sing his praises after his first start of the year the other day. So this is uh, it definitely won't be his last start of the season, and I can see him having a very valuable weekend from a fantasy basketball perspective. Um, that pretty much does it for the fantasy-relevant players for the um, New Orleans Pelicans. At this point, Jackson Hayes, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, uh, Nikola Melli, they are, should not be on your fantasy radars unless you're in the deepest of deepest of leagues. Um, I think it's smart to have Jackson Hayes and Naw on your radar. Um, well, I just said they should be off your fantasy radar for now, but you should kind of put them on your watch list for the future, right? When the Pelicans start losing games, uh, or if they continue to lose games, I should say, especially kind of nearing that all-star break time. I know that's a long ways away, but let's say, you know, kind of January is when we're, I would guess that, 
I think Jackson Hayes and Naw might see a little more, more minutes, especially if the Pelicans are kind of uh, more or less out of the Western Conference playoff contention there. Then you're going to want to keep Jackson Hayes and Naw on your t- um, on your watch list, I should say, to kind of have a late season surge and kind of help you out there as their minutes will increase as the player development uh, becomes more significant and uh, more prevalent for this season for the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, I know a lot of Pelican fans don't want to hear that, that this season's about player development and we might be out of the playoff race. But it's, you know, let's look at the facts here. It's looking like, it's more likely than not, I should say, that that's probably what's going to end up happening. Now, we'll see what happens when Zion Williamson comes back. But at 2 and 10, uh, I'm sorry, at 2 and 8 through 10 games of the season, it's not looking good for the New Orleans Pelicans. Right now, the eighth seed uh, for reference is the Phoenix Suns. They are sitting at 6-4 and four right now. So we're already four games back from the postseason after 10 games. That's not ideal. Um, however, you know, if we can get two or three, two out of three of these games this week until our next podcast, you know, maybe, you know, maybe even three of three. I mean, that's awfully optimistic. But you never know what can really happen. If we can turn it around soon, we'll be having a totally different discussion. However, at this point, I think it's fair to say or fair to assume that at some point in the season, the Pelicans will be turning over to player development. And with that will come many more valuable fantasy minutes for Jackson Hayes and Naw, who have shown the skill sets to have uh, to make very valuable fantasy basketball contributions. They have shown... Um, that they have favorable statistical skill sets for fantasy basketball if they were to get the minutes. So something to keep an eye on as the season progresses. But again, they should not be on fantasy radars at this moment. Uh, The Pelicans, I want to, before we sign out here, I want to talk about the Pelicans next, uh, next week. We have a game tonight as of this recording against the Clippers. And... Kawhi Leonard has just been ruled out for that game. Pat Beverly has been ruled out for load management. Uh, we might see Paul George in that game in his season debut. Reminder, he is has not played for the Los Angeles Clippers so far. Um, and uh, so good timing with Kawhi and Pat Beverly's uh, load management there. I'm not going to complain about load management when it comes against the Pelicans. And uh, the Miami Heat. We play, so we play the Clippers tonight and on Thursday. We play the Miami Heat on Saturday. That is at Miami, uh, and that's a. And we also have a rematch against the Warriors uh, as part of a back to back on Sunday that we've been talking about here. So I think that'll wrap it up. Hopefully, we can get two of these next three games. We'll do another podcast, kind of updating uh, y'all on the fantasy outlooks of Pelicans, and we'll you know maybe we'll even reference this podcast and bring it back and see if I was correct on making some of my regression predictions, buy low predictions, sell high predictions, that kind of stuff. Maybe we'll reference that again, but we'll do another fantasy pack, uh, basketball podcast periodically as the season progresses, just for those of you who are playing fantasy basketball and who do want to know what to do with your New Orleans Pelicans. That'll do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Pelicans cast, the official Pelicans podcast for HoopBall.com, in-flight insight for the sharpest Pella fans out there. As a reminder, if you like what you hear today or you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podcast. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes or whatever your podcast provider is. And we will see you next week. Hopefully, Michael Pelache will be back from his mission trip from Spain next week. we got a lot of Pelicans basketball to catch up on. See ya. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.